This is Hurstmanser Castle, astronomically the most famous castle in the world. It's the headquarters of the Royal Greenwich Observatory. As the name suggests, the Greenwich Observatory was originally in Greenwich Park, but with the spread of London, conditions there became unsuitable, and the observatory moved out to the clearer skies of Sussex. But even this won't really satisfy the needs of astronomers, and a new station is being built at La Palma in the Canary Islands. Here, conditions are excellent, and great new telescopes are just coming into use. A first light on the 100-inch Isaac Newton telescope will be due on the night of February the 13th, 14th, and for the first time, this great telescope will be turned to the sky. This, you know, is a great moment in the story of Greenwich Observatory, and the observatory itself goes back to the year 1675. Of course, there are some features of the observatory which everybody knows. There is, for example, the time department. And here, the atomic clocks are now better timekeepers than the Earth itself. And it's also from here that the six pips come out. And uh, as another interesting anniversary, actually today, because exactly 60 years ago, those six pips were first broadcast, which is another reason for our being here. Then there are the telescopes at Hurstman, sir. The 36-inch YAP reflector. Also a very useful 30-inch Coudet reflector. And the 13-inch and 26-inch refractors, which are used to measure accurate star positions. Then there's something different, the laser dome. And from here can be shot out a stream of green light, which contacts an artificial satellite moving around the Earth. And in this way, it's possible to measure the distance of the satellite to within a fraction of an inch. And combined with other observations, that means that you can actually measure the movements of the continents, either toward each other or drifting away from each other. But astronomy means looking at the sky, and hence the need for great observatories. And this is where I'm delighted to welcome back to the sky at night, Professor Alec Boxenberg, director of the Royal Greenwich Observatory. Welcome back, Alec. You know, I believe that some people think that because men have been to the moon and astronomical equipment has been launched, ground-based work is no longer useful. Now, that certainly isn't true. There's been a real renaissance in ground-based astronomy in recent years. Because there are some things you do from space which you just can't do from the ground. Far ultraviolet astronomy, for example, can only be done from above the atmosphere. Yeah. There's a new telescope to be launched, the Space Telescope, in about three years' time, which will have all these advantages that one, one gets from being above the atmosphere. Uh, another great advantage is getting above the shimmering effect of the atmosphere. So in, as we have from the ground here, the, image, uh, pro the problems with image smearing, all these are absent from space. Yes, and seeing conditions will be perfect all the time. On the other hand, consider the cost. Well, it's very expensive. In fact, the Space Telescope, which is about a 94-inch telescope, will cost pretty well a thousand million pounds. With that money, one can buy hundreds of really powerful ground-based instruments. There's also the point that the existing ground telescopes are a great deal more powerful than they were only a few decades ago. Well, that's true. They're the same telescopes as before, mm. but it's, this is entirely due to the development of new detectors, new instruments, new optics, fiber optics, new electronic techniques, new data handling techniques even, which make these telescopes maybe a hundred times more powerful than they used to be. They've got some wonderful results, haven't they, on the Anglo-Australian telescope? This was taken with a new solid-state detector. If you try to do this with conventional photographic emulsion, you'd never get it. And I know, of course, that the design and building of instruments and the processing of astronomical data, well, that's carried out right here at Hurstman, sir. In fact, these are our main activities, apart from operating the telescopes, as in all modern observatories now. If we didn't have a strong instrumentation program, we'd never keep pace with all the new developments going on elsewhere. And, of course, this brings a demand for new data processing techniques. And that's why we also have that activity now. Much of this is done in collaboration with the universities, by the way. I believe a team from Durham University have just been here trying out equipment. Yes, they've been testing an exciting new instrument on one of our telescopes here. Well, I imagine that the much maligned Sussex weather is good enough for that. Well, it's good enough for that, good enough for many things, but of course not ideal. That's why we've moved our main telescopes to that beautiful new site in La Palma. Well, it's certainly a picturesque location, as I well remember. And of course, this is really an integral part of the Hurstman Sir program. It certainly is. And of course, La Palma is an international observatory with astronomers from many nations in Europe participating. There's the Netherlands with us, 
in, in partnership. There's Sweden, Denmark, Germany, and of course Spain, and that's just the beginning. But here's another interesting point. Apart from we at Hussman are here providing all the organizational backup, uh, the instrumentation, the data handling facilities, means for preparing observations and so on, we'll also quite literally be operating telescopes, the telescopes here by remote control. Instead of the observer having to go to the mountain site, he'll come to the control room here and use the telescopes mentally transported but not physically. In fact, this saves a lot of observing time, makes it much more efficient, and this is really quite important nowadays because there's so much pressure on observing time. With the Netherlands, and Britain, just, just us, will be expecting something like 500 astronomers to apply for time, and they'll need to get the most efficient operation possible. Well, this certainly does make a great difference. And of course, La Palma is a Spanish island. Yes, and without the Spanish authorities, we'd never have got the whole thing started. They've been very helpful indeed. This is unquestionably one of the most exciting new projects for many years. Dr. Bob Fosbury, who is, fittingly, a Hurstman Sir astronomer, is chief project scientist at La Palma. As I said to him, great things are about to happen there. Yes, first light on the INT is in just a few days, and that's going to be followed shortly by first light on the one-metre Captain Telescope. Uh, we've called it the Captain Telescope after a famous Dutch astronomer who investigated the structure of our galaxy. Astronomers need far more than just good telescopes and good observing sites. They need a whole range of modern instruments and light detectors, plus the organization to make sure that everything is used to the best advantage. And that's where Hurstman, sir, comes in. Yes, that's right. Our job is to make sure that all the telescopes are provided with the very latest up-to-date instruments. The uh, instruments we need can't just be bought off the shelf. Uh, most of the time, we have to design and build the instruments specially for the programs the astronomers want to do. Uh, for the detectors, for instance, uh, we have to rely on commercial developments. The astronomers simply can't afford to do all the development work themselves. Uh, but nonetheless, the detectors are used in very non-standard ways, and so a lot of research and development has to go on to enable us to use them to best advantage. A good example is the CCD. Um, here we have to, the astronomers have to cool this detector to about minus 140 degrees centigrade to make it work best for the very faint light sources. Yes, we're hearing a lot about the CCD, the charge couple device. It's proved very effective, hasn't it? Yes, even though it's so terribly small, uh, it's proved to be immensely powerful. Uh, we can use this to take pictures of the sky, uh, but not only that, we can use this kind of detector in, in a spectrograph, for instance. And a good example of that is the faint object spectrograph. That's the uh, University of Durham, our geo collaboration that was mentioned earlier. This is a spectrograph that's designed specifically to exploit the capabilities of the CCD. It's designed to look at extremely faint objects. In fact, we hope to have this faint object spectrograph on the Isaac Newton telescope uh, during the summer, and we'll use it to observe the spectra of stars, galaxies, and quasars down to about the 21st magnitude. A million times fainter than the dimmest star you can see with the naked eye. Yes, that's right. And remember, we're spreading the light out into a spectrum as well. We're not just looking at a single point. In fact, this is one kind of observation where we expect to do at least as well as space telescope. That is, the spectroscopy of very faint galaxies. And then, of course, you'll be getting that also on the William Herschel telescope. Yes, when, that's particularly true when we get one of these faint object spectrographs on the, on the 4.2 meter. Well, that's certainly a very powerful telescope, one of the largest in the world. But what's so special about the William Herschel telescope? Well, first, of course, its size. As you say, it's the third largest single mirror telescope in the world. The other thing that's different about the 4.2 meter telescope is the fact that it has an altazimuth mount. That makes it much easier for the engineers to build and consequently cheaper. Uh, the fact that uh, the motions have to be quite complicated in an altazimuth mount can all be taken care of by the computer control. I believe that most of the telescope is already built. Yes, that's right, and we hope to have it operating in 1987. And this is going to be the largest common user telescope, isn't it? Yes, what we mean by that is being part of an international facility and not a private or a university observatory. Any astronomer is entitled to apply for time, uh, but the competition will be pretty fierce. Information isn't much for use unless it's processed. There have been great developments here, too, at Hurstman, sir, the Starlink system. And this is where I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Jasper Wall, head of the Research and Data Processing Division of the Royal Observatory. Welcome, Jasper. First, what exactly is the way in which you're tackling this problem? Well, Patrick, let's define the problem uh, 
to begin with. This is a stack of 16 tapes, and this is about one night's output from La Palma, and each of these tapes is uh, approximately half a mile in length. That's a total of eight miles of tape to analyze. Another way we might, might think of this is that uh, people are familiar now with home computers. Uh, a big home computer has a memory of 64K in the jargon, and the amount of data there would fill 1,600 of those big memory home computers. Is this, is this the only one, the only installation? Uh, no, in fact, we have, in, Stalink has uh, a total of eight computers, eight absolutely identical computers, scattered throughout the UK uh, at the major centers of, of astronomy. Why eight identical computers? Well, the, the identical part is the, the bit that stops us reinventing the wheel. In fact, we all observe with similar telescopes, uh, similar uh, instruments, and we all want to process the data in a similar way. So what astronomers have done in the past is to spend an awful lot of time developing the programs to tackle their own data. We want now to have a system. We do have a system with Starlink which shares that, shares that uh, capacity. Programs developed by one astronomer on one of these computers uh, can be used at all the other eight computers. Well, I know that Starlink extends over Britain. Does it extend elsewhere also? In fact, Starlink is a British first. We are the envy of our, our colleagues overseas, although they are now beginning to develop networks like, like Starlink. Uh, and eventually we hope to link our Starlink network with their networks and have perhaps a global astronomy data processing network. What's so special about these particular computers? Well, the special thing about them is that, first of all, they're able to handle very large amounts of data. Uh, they, they're geared for big blocks of data, as we get on these tapes. And the second thing is they're very fast and they can handle these blocks of data very rapidly. So that means we can use them in an interactive way. What does that mean exactly? What that means is that we can relate to the data, we can uh, intercompare the different, the different data sets uh, readily and, and immediately by, by uh, putting images up side by side and so forth. We can't, uh, data comes from big telescopes these days so fast that we can't actually make the discoveries, for the most part, at the telescopes. The discoveries are made right here in, in, in rooms like this and in, in, in seven other ones throughout the country um, when astronomers can essentially play back their nights observing at, at leisure, dare I say, uh, and, and look, at, look at the data hard in the cold light of day. Well, can you give us an example? I mean, what we have on the screen here looks to me like a pair of galaxies. Indeed it is. One of my uh, research interests is, in fact, interacting galaxies. And what we have here, what I'd like to show you as an example of, of how we use Starlink, uh, is, is indeed a pair of galaxies, one large elliptical galaxy and one spiral galaxy. We know it's a spiral because of its rather uh, elongated uh, uh, form. Almost edge onto us, in fact. Almost edge onto us. Now, let, let, let's blow it up for a start. Center it in a region of interest. And now, let me put a bit of color into the situation. Well, what does it get to that color mean? Well, obviously, the colors these, aren't real. Absolutely not. These are, these are false colors, termed false colors. They don't really represent colors in the sky at all. They represent levels of intensity. And the uh, enhancement process and the use of different levels of intensity enables us to distinguish uh, specific features which uh, will be of astronomical interest. If I do a bit of image enhancement like this, you can see that this spiral galaxy has a large and distorted spiral arm heading out straight towards this elliptical galaxy. And what's happening is the uh, huge gravitational field of this massive elliptical galaxy is tearing this spiral arm straight out of this poor, poor innocent little spiral galaxy uh, and essentially destroying it. And give it another 100 million years and that's exactly what it will have done. It'll have torn it to shreds and the spiral galaxy will have essentially fallen in to the elliptical galaxy. Classic case of cosmic cannibalism. What about uh, collisions and mergers? Uh, collisions and, and mergers provide us with uh, a, a set of, of truly fascinating uh, objects. Uh, this is, this is a, a merger in that eventually the spiral galaxy will have completely uh, fallen in to the elliptical galaxy. Uh, let me show you what happens when you have a real collision. Again, I'll start with the, the raw image. Um, not enhanced in, in, any, in any sense, a simple uh, black and white frame. This is a particularly strange uh, object which Bob Fosbury uh, and I investigated some years ago. Uh, and it's strange because you can, as you can see, it has all kinds of uh, plumes and it has legs and arms going in all directions. So the question was, what, what is it? 
Now, Bob and I put forward the hypothesis that it was a pair of spiral galaxies uh, in, in collision. And you can imagine how you'd get such strange features if you, if you took things with spiral arms and let them set them at each other to tear those spiral arms into all kinds of strange shapes. Incredibly complicated, in fact. Exceptionally complicated. Let me expand the picture to begin with again. Yeah, you start to see the complications, don't you? Now you can see the, the complex system of dust lanes and plumes and, and, and streamers. And the bit I want to focus attention on is, the, is the, the central region of this. Now, in fact, Patrick, it's the, it's the nucleus that I want to draw your attention to. And let me just adjust the color system and levels again. And now we can see that this nuclear region is, in fact, double. Now, this is the fascinating thing to, for, for Bob Fosbury and myself, because our original hypothesis was based on photographic plates, and there was no way we could distinguish whether there was a double nucleus here or not. And this discovery of the double nucleus lends an awful lot of weight to our original hypothesis that this is indeed a pair of colliding spiral galaxies. Could you have established that, do you think, without the CCD and Starlink? I think it would have been absolutely impossible. It's the combination of the sensitivity and linearity of the CCDs and the image manipulation um, abilities of the Starlink system. Well, it does seem to have an amazingly bright future, and um, I imagine that you're now waiting with bated breath the flood of information coming in from La Palma. It can't come quick enough. We must continually provide new instrumentation so that we remain competitive quite uh, right up at the forefront with all the other observatories, which are equally striving to get the best that they can out of their instrumentation. But what about the next 10 years? Well, there's a lot to come yet. There's all sorts of new devices which are being designed and, and invented, but perhaps I'll just pick one or two of them as an example. There's a method of stabilizing the image, image stabilization, uh, coupled with speckle interferometry, which will allow us to, f to observe very fine detail, much finer than normally the atmospheric shimmer would allow. And also by coupling telescopes into an interferometric pair or triplet, we'll be able to Find, uh, go much further still and, in fact, uh, beat space telescope by maybe a hundred times. What about large ground-based telescopes? We aren't at the limit yet, are we? No. In fact, uh, we've now got to the stage where our instrumentation is so sensitive that the only really big advance we can make is by increasing the aperture of the telescope. We are, at the moment, here thinking of um, new telescopes, possibly of aperture 18, 20 meters. That's more than... 700 inches uh, to get into this field which many other countries in the world are at the moment working quite intensively. Will they be single mirror telescopes or multi mirror telescopes? Well, there's all sorts of possibilities. The uh, perhaps cheapest method is to think of multi mirror telescopes or arrays, small arrays of telescopes. But of course, one can make a single dish. This is something which is being studied in the States. But I think the multi-mirror approach is probably better for us. Do you think we in Britain can really do that? I'm sure we can do it, and I also have to say that, that we must do it if we're to remain, uh, remain up at the forefront with all the others, all the other nations which are, are working in this field now. If we hadn't planned our present telescopes 10 years ago, then we wouldn't really be at the forefront with our partners and with other nations as we are now. We would be way behind. So La Palma, in fact, is tremendously important. Tremendously important, well planned. So we look into the future, not only with enthusiasm, but also with confidence. I know that a tremendous flood of information is going to come from La Palma very soon after first light. Meanwhile, from Hurstmanshire Castle, good night. Twenty-four.